Hey guys, welcome to the YouTube channel of the Stroke and Brain Aneurysm Center of Long Island. This is Dr. Kimon Beckles. And Jason Wallen. All right, so um, uh, today we're going to tackle another subject that uh, we get a lot of questions about. Um, we've spoken before about arteriovenous malformations, but today we're going to speak about cerebral cavernous malformations, a subject very similar, uh, but with some distinct differences as compared to arteriovenous malformations. Uh, and uh, those differences really make uh, um, uh, result in a very different management and interventions. And uh, a lot of folks are asking us about about uh, cerebral cavernous mal malformations or cavernomas for short, or CCMs. Uh, they go by uh, different names. Uh, and um, so we're gonna we're gonna jump in and try to give some explanations for that. Right, Jay? Sounds awesome. All right, so um, what, what a cavernous malformation, cerebral cavernous malformation is, is very similar to an, a, to an arteriovenous malformation in the sense that it is an abnormal connection between arteries and veins. And as we've discussed before, arteries bring blood at high speed, high velocity, high pressure to um, the capillaries, which then decrease the speed of the blood, and then, of course, eventually blood goes into the veins at much, much lower speed and pressure. Uh, but of course, if you have a situation where that slowing down process doesn't happen, then you have high uh, speed blood going to uh, an area that's, that's not used to seeing that kind of pressure, right? Uh, and uh, that increases the risk of bleeding. That's when arteriovenous malformation is. So uh, cavernomas are similar uh, in the fact that you have that abnormal connection, but they are made by a lot smaller blood vessels. They're made by really, really small uh, arterioles and, and venules, and, and so their ability to bleed substantially is smaller. They still bleed, but they're not gonna bleed as aggressively probably as an arteriovenous malformation because, of course, arteriovenous malformations are a lot larger blood vessels. So uh, very important to understand that difference, and, and that makes all the difference uh, when it comes to management, right? Um, and, and so cavernomas can occur anywhere in the brain, similar to arteriovenous malformations, uh, and they're discovered most of the times, if they haven't bled, of course, they are discovered incidentally. And incidentally means that um, you get a scan for something else and all of a sudden you get a call that you have a malformation in the brain, which uh, sounds ominous, but as far as things that you can have goes go, this is probably one of the more benign things. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe, maybe uh, Jay, you can take it from here with some questions that, that we have from the audience, and uh, uh, then I can answer and maybe give some more information on uh, cavernomas that way. Absolutely. Um, are they hereditary? So that's a very common question mm -hmm. we get, and uh, contrary to most vascular problems in the brain, they actually are in the majority of the cases or in a lot of cases rather, not the majority necessarily, but they are, uh, they can be hereditary. Um, now, uh, being hereditary means, of course, that they're transmitted from um, generation to generation. Uh, they pass on, uh, and uh, uh, that's, uh, that's common. Uh, and of course, f majority of cavernomas that are not hereditary are still part of a genetic mutation. Right, so we know that um, almost 70 to 80 percent of all cavernomas can be explained by a mutation that's well identified, uh, and those mutations um, are in the CCM1, CCM2, and CCM3 genes. So there's three genes that can explain uh, almost all cavernomas. Uh, and so, contrary to most other diseases in the brain where we haven't been able uh, to identify their genetic origin for, for cavernous malformations, we're, we're very uh, knowledgeable when it comes to that. Hmm. Uh, another good question is, you know, if you find that you have one, like you said, it can be incidentally found. Right. Uh, when is surgery recommended? Oh, that's a great question. So surgery uh, is rare when it comes to cavernous malformations. So most of the times with cavernous malformations, we monitor them and we monitor them for growth. Now, as a disease, they are, um, they're always evolving and changing, contrary to most other static diseases, right? They, because these blood vessels, um, these connections are not very well made, those abnormal connections, they're constantly leaking blood at the microscopic level. So you always have this rim 
of blood around the cavernoma. And large, larger bleeds are, are of course, more rare. Um, but cavernomas can, because of that rim of blood, they can look bigger on a scan, smaller. And so changes in, in a small scale are, are frequent. The decision to do surgery depends on two things, depends on symptoms and how many times somebody has had a significant bleed. Uh, and so generally speaking, we accept at least twice um, of a, a, two episodes of, of a bleed to, to proceed with surgery. So if mm-hmm. somebody has had two distinct bleeding events, then you proceed with surgery. If you've had one bleeding event, generally speaking, we don't recommend surgery. And uh, a lot of folks would say, well, you know, it bled already. Why won't you take it out? Mm-hmm. Well, the reason is that these are generally fairly dormant even after they bleed or, or significant or, you know, they're not going to give any more significant clinical symptoms. So you generally leave them alone to not take the risk of surgery. But but cavernomas uh, can be in multiple locations, right? So so the, the two-event rule doesn't always apply if a cavernoma is in a very difficult to operate part of the brain like in the brain stem or sometimes in the spinal cord, um, you tend to avoid surgery. Uh, and so even if you have a couple of bleeds, surgery might be too risky in that case, so you wouldn't necessarily operate on them uh, even if you follow that, uh, that uh, you know, two-event rule. But, but that's kind of a, a good segue to understand how those present, the symptomatic ones, the ones that bleed, right? If a cavernoma bleeds, it can present as classic stroke like symptoms, weakness, numbness, and ability to speak by the effect of the blood in the surrounding tissue. So it would be similar to a hemorrhagic stroke at that point. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, in those cases, you wait for the blood to go away like any other bruise anywhere else in your body. And when the blood goes away, symptoms generally tend to get a little better. Um, that, that's one way to present. And the other way is uh, with seizures, right? Um, seizures. Uh, can be the result of blood from the cavernoma irritating the surrounding nervous tissue. Uh, and those generally would be controlled initially with medications. Of course, somebody has a hard time with that, then of course surgery is a reasonable approach to take out um, the cavernoma. And I, I'd say the last way of presentation for a ruptured um, cavernous malformation will probably be headache, uh, headaches. Uh, and so headaches uh, can indicate increased pressure uh, and in this setting, it, it can indicate uh, bleeding from uh, from a cavernous malformation. So, uh, you know, we we talk about surgery. What are the options? So, with with cavernomas, options are limited for treatment. Right, one is to just watch it uh, and monitor it with scans and make sure it doesn't get bigger. It doesn't get uh, and, and bigger would mean that it's bleeding, right? Um, and the other option is to take the cavernoma out. Um, there's not a lot of other options when it comes to kind of mainstream proven methods to treat the cavernomas. Of course, there is stereotactic radiosurgery mm-hmm. uh, for deep-seated and difficult-to-reach cavernous malformations, um, but that's that's not for every single cavernous malformation. And sometimes, and that's a, a very specific personalized decision that a patient and a physician need to make together, understanding the challenges and the risks that come from stereotactic radiosurgery in these deep cavernomas and the fact that there, those interventions with stereotactic radiosurgery in particular for these problems are less effective than surgery, by and large, in, in treating cavernous malformations. They're a little different from arteriovenous malformations th- this way, right? Arteriovenous malformations, radiosurgery is very effective in treating generally. Uh, for, for cavernous malformations, that doesn't necessarily apply. Mm-hmm. And so, so these are um, the three treatment options of which two are definitely, or I shouldn't say treatment, I guess, more uh, management options. The two first, observation and resection, are very well accepted for pretty much um, all lesions, and uh, and then you have uh, stereotactic radiosurgery for those areas that are challenging and difficult to get to. Hmm. And, I, I, you know, if somebody is diagnosed with it, the overall prognosis, you would say? Is a very good one. Um, big exception to that rule is if the cavernoma uh, is in the brainstem, right? And, and it's bled multiple times. Uh, these are some very unfortunate situations that um, often you cannot really intervene in. And, you, you know, you're just watching a patient over time getting more and more and more symptomatic. Mm-hmm. Uh, not always, but some of them will get more and more symptomatic. And when that happens, of course, you know, it's one of those challenging 
situations to, to deal with because operating is not always an option in these cases. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that kind of sums it all up. Super. Yeah, so, um, you know, cavernomas, a uh, very, very important subject for us in uh, neurovascular neurosurgery. And also, let's not forget that they need to be differentiated from a lot of other pathologies in the mm -hmm. brain. Uh, and to some extent, if you have to have something in the brain, that's not the worst thing to have, especially something that's cortical, easy to get to if it bleeds a couple of times. Um, and so with that, I want to thank you guys. Uh, and uh, uh, don't forget to like and subscribe our videos. And uh, we will catch you in another episode. Thank you. Thank you.